So this is a great day, and I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is John Tolo, and uh, I've been blessed. God, you know, sometimes people um, say to me, um, uh, they, they see some of the things that God's doing around my family and around the people that I work with, and they say, wow, you have a really great ministry. And, you know, I have to just say right off the bat that I do not have a great ministry. I have watched God do something in an area and I felt when I, when, I, when I was growing up, I actually grew up in the church and I left the church when I was young and I got involved with drugs and alcohol. My life was just a disaster. I was homeless for about four years and um, I got to this point where I knew that demons were trying to kill me. I mean, I could tell that there was, uh, I, I felt, I literally felt, if you watch the movie, there's a hitman in it. I felt like there was a d demonic presence that was a hitman that wanted to just wipe me off the face of the earth. And in one week, I almost got killed two times. And after the second time, I was leaving the hospital, and I was walking, and I was crying. I didn't have my shoes. I'd lost my shoes somehow. So I'm walking down the street in socks, just a disaster. Look, I looked like a disaster. And I just said, you know, God, if you're there, I need you to do something, or I'm going to be dead, or I'm going to be in jail, or something like that. And immediately, I began to hear God say, John, you're my son, I love you. And in fact, um, you know, it changed everything for me to hear the father tell me that he loved me. And when he said, John, you're my son, it was interesting because I felt, it felt so dangerous all around me. Everything that was going on in my life felt so dangerous. I never felt depressed. I didn't feel like a depressed person or an insane person, but I, I was so overwhelmed with this fear of this of death and this fear of this demonic thing it wasn't even death it was a demonic presence that I would I was actually um I was I was kind of homeless at the time and I was hiding in my mom's basement she didn't even know that I was like sneaking in at night and sleeping on the floor in the basement and because I, I was so afraid but as soon as I heard my father say John you're my son I love you I felt safe I felt like I was in the right place at the right time. And so I've been, in, I've been involved with ministry in some way or another since 1992. Uh, in 1992, I felt God tell me that he wanted me to be a disciple. I heard Jesus' voice say, follow me. So I said, okay. And I said, how do you do that? <laughs> I had no idea, you know, because I was kind of come, I, was, I would re relapse every once in a while and my life was still in shambles. And uh, he said, follow me. And I was like, oh, how do you do that? And I, I heard Jesus tell me, go to Teen Challenge. And so I went to a men's program that is a discipleship program called Teen Challenge in 1992. And it just began this process that God's brought me through of bringing me to a space where he is moving. And then I got to see God do crazy, American, amazing things, you know. And, uh, and so for the past... Um, uh, I'm going to show you actually a video in a moment about the mission that I work with. It's called God Town, and uh, and we um, I, I I I could tell that uh, God called us to this space. It's actually a, a neighborhood in our city that has got lots of drugs, lots of gangs. Uh, when we went to the neighborhood, my wife and I went to, uh, it was um, almost all the ho half the houses were abandoned. So there was it looked like a war zone literally, and um, so there's abandoned houses and there were people squatting in houses that were drug drug houses and God told us told my wife and I uh, he told me and I told my wife and she didn't know if it was God or not but uh, she said <laughs> I told her that we were going to go and find a house that was an abandoned drug house and God was going to do a transformation miracle in it and she's from a little small town so she was like okay <laughs> I don't know if I believe that or not but okay I'm I mean, she and you know she's my partner I don't tell her what to do she she, we listened to the Holy Spirit together, but, um, but um, it was amazing because we started, we spent um, about eight months looking for the place that God had told us that we were going to go to, and, uh, and then about two weeks before we found it, my wife had a dream, and uh, in this dream, she saw this house with a gold cross above it, and so we started we were, we, I don't know that we had a formula, but we were kind of like looking, is there a gold cross over <laughs> any of these houses that we're looking at? Finally, one day, a couple of weeks after her dream, we drove up to this house, and I opened the door. It was in the spring. It was like in April. I opened the door, 
And it felt like I stepped into the street and that there was a river of the Holy Spirit moving. And I literally got, I felt drunk when I got out of the car. And my wife and I started I, I, kind of giggling. I usually don't giggle, but I was like, <laughs> You know, oh, this is good. This is good. I feel something happening. You know, I think God's here. And uh, she got out of the car and she looked up and over the house, the house was right in front of a Catholic church. So right behind was this huge gold cross over the house. And she's looking at the house and the house is a disaster. So she's like, oh, no, I don't know. But she's like, this is the house that God showed me. So we knew. So the, so the thing that I just realized is ever since I heard God say, John, you're my son. You know, I've looked for that place where God's presence is because when you're in the center of what God's doing, it's the safest place you can be. I mean, you could be in Syria right now, and if I'm a missionary, and if God tells you to go to Syria and he has a space for you to be where if there's bombs going off and everything, that is the safest possible place you can be. And if you don't believe me, ask Jonah. Because Jonah knows, Right? You know, it's better to be in the center of what God has in a place that feels uncomfortable to everybody else than to be in the belly of a whale, right? So I'm going to show you this video, and I actually, uh, one of the things that's a real blessing to me is that we work with literally, I think, hundreds of young adults that we get to work with, and I'm going to share about revival this morning because revival, just, I know that you know it because I see it happening here. But literally all around the world right now, God is moving in this generation in a powerful way. And so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. But I'm going to show you a video. And then I have some team members that are here. And they're going to get up and they're going to minister for a few minutes before I continue. So. communion um, during worship, which was amazing, by the way. Thank you so much, guys. Um, it was struck to me again the goodness and glory and wonder of our God. Um, and just even, this is my body broken for you. And <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. Overwhelmed. He's so cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I was 14 to 16, I had a deep depression and was suicidal and a cutter and just overwhelmed by so many different things, yet I still was a Christian. My dad was a pastor, or is a pastor, and, um, and I was just, I strove so hard for perfection, and I did not understand his grace, and, and I took communion and I heard the words, but I didn't understand them. And as we took it today, I was just reminded once again of the goodness that, that God is and who he is and how he just surrounds us with it. And the song I'm going to sing is along those lines. And so I just wanted to preface it with this. Um, I was 16 years old, and I had just sliced up my arms again. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I don't understand. And I'm like so depressed, and I don't understand why this is wrong, and I can't understand why I can't quit. And I'm like, just would you just speak to me? And, uh, and I hear this voice. There's only two times in my life I've ever heard the audible outside of my head voice of God. And this is his first time. And he said, Bethany, when you give yourself scars, you're saying that mine aren't enough. And it was at that moment that like, I was just blown away by what grace actually means. His body broken for me. So my body doesn't have to be. His blood shed and covering my sins so I don't have to be covered in them. One of my favorite bands is this group called My Epic and they have this line in one of their songs that says, you didn't die for sins, you died covered in them. All of our sins, all of the lies, every brokenness, everything that needs to be healed was placed upon him because we can't bear it. I can barely bear my own things. And here our Lord and our Savior took everything. And uh, this song is called Reckless Love. Um, I hope some of you know it. You can totally join in. And it is one of my favorites. Absolutely love this song. And it was not what I was planning to play until like 15 minutes ago. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Before 
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life into me. You have been so, so kind to me. We're going to sing that again. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I breathe the breath, you breathed your life into me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all the I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it So you gave yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God so good. When I was your fool, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I found no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh,
Ah, okay, run. Just stay in the place where you are right now. Um, Holy Spirit has just been speaking to me so much on like love this morning. And this song is so apt. Holy Spirit is really speaking to each and every one of us this morning. And He wants to just pour out so much more love on your life. You know, some of you might think that this is it. It's just coming to church every Sunday and that's, that's all you need to do. But He wants a deep loving relationship with you. And there's always more. There's always more to what God can do. And I was just thinking over my life, I was thinking of my testimony and how I made some really, really bad decisions. You know, I used to think, oh God, if this is life, you know, struggling and being hurt and being rejected all the time, is this really what life is about? Then what's the point in believing in you, God? Like, what are you doing for me? And you know, I just made so many wrong decisions and it wasn't to do anything with God. It was everything to do with me because I was the one that's lost. God never lost me. He always knew where I was. He always knew what I was doing. And when I, when I think about how we as humans in the world often treat each other and how we think towards each other, I think we've put so much rights on ourselves. We've given ourselves so much more credit for ourselves than what we even deserve. You know, if, if you hurt me, then I don't need to talk to you again. And, you know, you're going to get the consequences of that. And, you know, we put up all these barriers and all these walls. There's so much condition that we hold. Our version in the world of love is if you love me, then I might love you back. If you do A, B, C for me, then I might do something back for you. But if you don't show me this, then I won't show you that. And it's all conditional. Jesus' love was unconditional. For the times that had I done something towards a man or a woman or somebody in my life, they would have rejected me and I have been rejected by people because of the condition that we've put on each other. But Jesus was always, always there for me. He was always there. His love kept calling out the goodness, kept saying, but that's not who you are. For the times when I stand in church and I would just lift my hands and I'd just sing to him and just say, I love you. And then during the week, I'd just go and get drunk. I would just go and mess around with different guys. I would go and get high on weed. And God still was always sat there with me. He always, always called me out of where I was. And I just thank him so much for his unconditional love. That I can't help that when I'm worshiping, I can't help but dance and I can't help but sing and I can't help but pour everything I have out into him because the love that he's given me deserves me even looking stupid for him. Are you willing to look stupid for Jesus? Yeah. You know, I really feel that some people in here are suffering with the past of rejection, rejection from people. And I want you to look back into your, into your past or even like near few, um, present, present uh, state situation. And I want you to see about the people around you and see where you may have had that rejection. And just understand that when you look up, when you look up, Father God is looking down on you and he's like, but I've accepted you. And that means so much more. In the grand scheme of the whole life, you know, we're not here to just get a nine to five, have babies and then we get old and then we die. There's so much more. We have, the, we have access to heaven. We're already living in eternity and we're able to pull down the things from the kingdom of heaven. And I really feel this morning he wants to do that. There's people in here that need emotional healing from rejection. And I also feel that there's people in here that need healing from um, migraines. If you get migraines or anything um, in your nervous system, in your head, which causes like, um, you know, sinus issues or jaw ache. There's people in here that need um, healed knees and ankles. I was receiving a lot of pain in my, in my knees and ankles over the last couple of days. And that's not, I know it wasn't mine and also the right elbow. And then for every single one of us, he wants to place a new fire in our stomachs this morning. 
So if that's you that needs a healing this morning, can you just put your hand up for me? Holy Spirit, just come. And if you're stood or sat next to somebody with their hand up, can you just lay your hand on them for me? Okay, and ask that person what it is that they need. Jesus. Okay, everybody that has their hand up should have someone next to them that's put a hand on their shoulder. I'm doing this on purpose because it's not about us as the team. Like, we've seen healings. This last, even yesterday, I had three words of knowledge from God. One of them was for a pain in the right arm. So I asked the gentleman that I thought it was, and he said, yeah, prayed and the pain had gone. In the evening, we had another service, and I'd already seen on this woman, I had a flashback, which is strange. I never really receive it like this, but I saw primary school. I dig deeper, and I'm asking Holy Spirit, what does this mean? And I couldn't get anything. So I'm praying for her, and I had a pain in my neck. So I asked her two questions. Do you have pain in your neck? And she said, yeah. So we pray for that and it goes. I then ask her, did you used to work in a primary school? Is there anything about a primary school where this has been a situation that um, has meant a lot to you? And, you know, we were going back and forth for a little bit and I'm thinking, wow, I'm way off. <laughs> this isn't really from God. I must have just been imagining stuff. So I just ask Holy Spirit to come and reveal to her what that meant. And then she had the revelation that so many years ago, she was in a primary school and something demonic happened between someone that was there as potentially a witch who had done something. She didn't go into detail, but it's set her son back from the Lord. It traumatized them as a family so much. But Holy Spirit loves us so much that he'll even give a stranger a word of knowledge because he loves you. He'll, he'll use those that want to be used. And she cried and there was release and there was freedom and then there was hope imparted by the Holy Spirit into her life. And Holy Spirit wants to do that for us this morning. So for those of you that had your hand up, start to receive right now. And we just pray that Holy Spirit, you just come down and God in your sovereignty, just come and heal your children. Heal the migraines, heal the knee pain, heal the ankle pain, heal the... Uh, the pain in the elbow and Lord God I just impart a fire of God into the stomach of everybody here right now and that our hunger grows in this church for the community because this is where it begins this is where it starts this is the environment this is where the culture is going to be birthed from out of this place as the Holy Spirit is just moving around the room right now just keep your eyes closed and start pressing into him ask him what it feels like to feel his presence ask him what it feels like to be burning with the fire of the Holy God Holy God, just come right now and just burn with your fire. Burn with your fire. Just burn with your fire, God. Holy Spirit, just come. Come and as you feel the heat, just welcome Him. Welcome Him into your life and ask Him to know what it is to be free. Because here is a place of freedom. You're going to have people come in that need you. They need you. The community needs you. The community needs you, but they need you to be ready and they need you to be free. Thank you, Jesus. Your struggle is not too big for God. Your struggle is minor, it's so small. And that's not to disrespect you or dishonor you. I know it can be really hard for what you're going through, but look up to God and see how big He is, see what He's created. Even the wind, even the birds, even the trees, even the grass, they all worship Him. Oh, Jesus. If you had a pain or if you had a sickness in your body and you're able to test it out, can you just test it out for me right now? Just move, bend, move up your knees, move your ankles, move your head. And can you just wave for me if you feel that you've received your healing right now? I sit and start to worship him, give me a little whoop, give me something. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. We have some people over here that we've already had healing. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Come on, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate what God's doing. This is amazing. This is you know, God is healing people in the room right now. And if you haven't received it just yet, we're going to go in one more time. Keep your hand on that person because Holy Spirit wants to work through you. He wants to work through you. Pray for that person for their healing. Can we all stand up a second? Can we all just stand? Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Jes
Thank you. You know, when royalty or when someone walks in the room, we stand because we're honoring them. And Jesus and Holy Spirit is here, and I just feel to stand. I just feel to stand. Thank you, Jesus. So test out again. If you had that pain in your body, test out your ankles, test out your knees, your arms. And wait for me again if you've received your healing this morning. Because we want to glorify God and we want to just raise the faith levels in this room this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. As we go into this song again, I just want to sing over whatever you feel, Beverly, whatever part. But listen to the words if you don't know it. And think, when, when would have people, when would have man rejected me in my life? And then replace that with, but God didn't reject me and allow his love to just overflow and bubble in you because it's such revelation. Because in the world it makes sense. But when you start walking in the kingdom of God, he's like, that doesn't make sense. I love you more than that. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've come from. Even if last night you know that you've done something that you shouldn't have done and that God wouldn't be happy with you. Do you know what, he's smiling on you this morning for being here. He's glad that you're here this morning. You're here for a reason. So yeah, just lift your hands and just begin to worship him. Thank you, Jesus. your power you've sent your power you don't just stand your words you've sent your power you've sent your power send your fire down send your fire down your power you've sent your power you don't just send your words you've sent your power you sent your power send your fire song just for you so open your ears and hear what he has to sing to you there's a song just for you so open your ears he wants to sing to you you are loved Brother, hear me, your love. You are loved. Sister, hear me, your love. Just lift up your hands. Just lift up your hands to God and receive whatever you need right now. You're pulling it down from heaven. It's a prophetic act. Just lift your hands up high. You do it at a football match. You do it when you're it, your most excited moment. Why don't we do it for God? If you've been in a place where you've been more excited about that thing than over God, then there's something wrong. When we're in heaven, I don't think I'm going to be stood in front of God just like, okay, cool, you're God. I think I'll probably be flat on my face. Just imagine him in front of you right now because he's here. Just honor him. He left the 99 to come searching for you, for the one. 
And allow him to just touch your hands, let the fire of God just fall on your hands as you just reach up to heaven and say, God, I need you. I need you in my life right now. I need revelation. I need answers. joy flow through this place. Let joy just overwhelm and replace all fear, replace all striving, replace all depression, replace all guilt or shame. I'm going to lead us all in a prayer together. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You can have a seat. Bethany, I'm going to have you stay and just play really quietly. I'm not going to speak for a long time, but I'm going to take a risk with you today uh, because I, I, I have to say, you know, I'm not Irish. I'm not from Ireland. I'm not from Northern Ireland. I, um, I grew up in the United States, so I'm an American, and um, I, I was sharing earlier in one of our other meetings that, so I, I spent a number of years out in the world away from the Lord, and one of the things that happened to me when I was just in high school is I heard Bono sing Gloria, <laughs> and uh, I fell in love with you too, and it was uh, really interesting, is that me? It was, uh, I fell in love with uh, the band U2, and it kind of uh, really stirred something in my spirit about Ireland, you know, and I'd watch videos and things, and I'd, you know, hear about the troubles that were going on here, and it just, I just kind of always had this wonder, and I grew up, my father um, uh, got filled with the Holy Spirit. He was in seminary at uh, Luther, which is a Lutheran university, a uh, Lutheran seminary, actually, in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And, uh, and I was four years old, 1967. Uh, he went and he had a, met a guy who uh, was moving in the charismatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a revival that was happening in the United States. And it, it was happening across all the mainline denominations. So Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, um, Lutheran, they, Episcopal, they were all having this move of the Holy Spirit. And it actually started with a very small group of students at, I think it was Duquesne University, in, in a, at, which is a Catholic university, that they started praying and the Holy Spirit to pour out. They were just young people, and they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how to... Sometimes we think we know how to make the Holy Spirit move. It doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit moves the way that the Holy Spirit wants to move. And, uh, but he, uh, he went and he got prayed for and he got filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, he decided to leave seminary and um, he kind of went on this journey to find out where the Holy Spirit was moving. And so we were living in St. Paul, and uh, then we moved to uh, San Francisco. So some of you, if you know the history in the United States, 1968 was a significant year in a place called San Francisco. And uh, it was the beginning of the hippie movement in the, in the, um, in the 70s. And, uh, 
my, I lived there, I was in kindergarten when that happened. And, um, and my dad started kind of trying to figure out where the Holy Spirit was moving at that time and he connected with some people called the Jesus People. And it ended up actually at a black Pentecostal church. And uh, he was there and they were dancing. I don't know if you've ever seen, has anybody ever seen the movies, The Blues Brothers? So in the Blues Brothers, you know, they have this thing where the guys are, John, John Belushi is like flipping in the air and Dan Aykroyd's jumping up and down and they're shouting and going at it. So my dad actually felt the Holy Spirit move in that kind of church. And so we ended up moving, we, we ended up going and uh, we moved from San Francisco to Connecticut and my, and my father met the bishop of the Church of God in Christ in Connecticut and the bishop was really excited to have this young, fiery white guy in this black neighborhood, <laughs> in this black church, and this young guy really wanted to experience the Holy Spirit. So he made him the assistant to the bishop. So I grew up in a black Pentecostal church, and I grew up in a neighborhood that was probably one of the most violent neighborhoods in the United States at that point because of the racial conflict that was going on. And so it was one white family in this whole area filled with Puerto Rican families and African American families. And there was gangs and there was violence. And you know, I grew up in this church where the Holy Spirit people, I mean literally every Sunday, you know, you guys sit a lot. They stand a lot, <laughs> and they dance a lot. So, and your services, we'd go from 9 o'clock in the morning till, you know, 1.30. We'd have Sunday school, then we'd have church for, you know, three hours, and then we'd go home and take a little nap, and then we'd come back and we'd have church again from 6 to 11 o'clock at night. I hated it. <laughs> I didn't want to be. I, was, I wanted to watch, you know, the $6 million man be like a normal kid, you know, watch uh, the Bionic Woman or something, you know. And so I felt really left out because I had to be in this church where uh, the Holy Spirit would hit and people with demons would roll around on the floor. And they sometimes you'd see somebody getting delivered and he'd kind of slither down the row like a like a snake or he would start dancing and people would have these massive encounters with the Holy Spirit. And that was my experience growing up. And uh, it was really interesting because when I was a teenager, uh, my father, my father, you know, really studied the church. He studied Greek. My sister, I have a sister, her name is Yasha. And Yasha is the feminine version of Yeshua. And because he, he left seminary, but he kept studying Hebrew and he kept studying Greek and he kept studying the move of the Holy Spirit over the last 2,000 years. And, uh, and my, because my father grew up Lutheran, he still had this passion for liturgical things and he loved the Holy Spirit, but he liked the whole expression of the church. So when I was 13, I don't know why he did this, but he did. He decided that I needed to get confirmed and I needed to receive First Communion. So he took me, I'm the oldest of eight, and he took me, and at that time there was six of us, so he took me and my siblings and he put us all in a Catholic church. And so I went from this black Pentecostal, jumping up and down, to this very, I mean, it was, at that time, it was still Latin Mass, so they, they went to this, this service where it was all in Latin, and I sang in the choir, and you know, it was really interesting, because I didn't know any better, and I was used to feeling the Holy Spirit, and I would go, and I would start singing in the choir, and I would sing in Latin, or I would sing in Old English, or I'd sing in German, because I love to sing, and I would sing like Gloria in a Celsius Deo or Hosanna or things like that and I would feel the Holy Spirit hit me. I'd feel the Holy Spirit. So to me it was really interesting. It didn't, it didn't matter whether it was liturgical. You know, it didn't matter whether it was cultural. It didn't matter whether it was a Lutheran church. It didn't matter whether it was a black church. It didn't matter what kind of service it was. I realized that when my heart was going after God, something would happen. So when I was uh, a little bit older, uh, because of my own self, sometimes I like to put the responsibility for my sin on somebody else. Do we do that sometimes? Yeah, we like to say, well, it was because of this person that I went and like slept around, or I, I got drunk because you made me. And so I had this thing where, you know, I felt kind of lonely. I was the oldest in my family, and I 
got involved with pornography. And uh, by the time I was 16 years old, I was convinced that the answer to my loneliness was if I could just have a girlfriend. I think that's probably something most boys and maybe, probably, I don't, I'm not a girl, so maybe most girls feel that way too, but I felt like the answer to my loneliness was to have a relationship with somebody. And so I, I started pursuing that. That became the focus of my life. And you know, it totally took me away from God. I ended up having my first cigarette when I was about, I, you know, before that, because I grew up in the church, I, I, I had sworn up and down. I wouldn't smoke cigarettes. I, not too long after I smoked a cigarette, I got a, a, a 40 ounce bottle of uh, malt liquor and I drank that and I started drinking alcohol. And I, I had always said I was never gonna do that. And then not long after that, I started, a young guy asked me if I wanted to smoke marijuana. I never, I told, I said I would never get high, but I started smoking marijuana. And before I knew it, I, every kind of drug there was, I did. So far away from God, and I shared my testimony earlier. And you know, it was interesting because after I came back to the Lord, I didn't really know where to go to church. You know, I, I just went wherever. I went, to, I went to Mass. I went to Pentecostal churches, and God brought me to Teen Challenge, so I ended up going to Teen Challenge. And I have, in my life, I have preferences. Like, I like you too. Like, if I was going to listen to something, I like to listen to you too. And I like listening to worship music, and I like listening to different things. But one of the things that God has really done with me is, I mean, I, I, go, to a, a, I go to a church, actually, just like this. It's very, very much like this. But in the past 10 years, I, you know, my, um, so my wife is, uh, my wife grew up Catholic. And um, when we first got married, um, she got pregnant uh, with triplets. And so we, um, we went through eight months of uh, waiting for these three beautiful girls to be born. And they were born, and uh, just right after they were born, they died, all three of them. And it was, it was really, really, diff it was really, um, it was extremely painful. And in that process, you know, God, you know, I, I, I wrote down in here, you know, one thing that I, I, you know, I'm a man, and so, you know, men have a problem. You know what their problem is? They like to be right. You know, I, 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 I could have an opinion about something, and I could go to my wife, and I'd say, you're right, I'm right, and you're wrong. I may have the correct, I wasn't talking to you, <laughs> but I would, I would say that I had the right, you know, perspective or whatever, and during that time, there was, it was so difficult to go, through, to go through my wife's pregnancy with our daughters. It was very, very painful, and, um, and, and I, one of the things that God spoke to me during that time is he, he said, John, I didn't ever call you to be right. I told you that I want you to be righteous. And you know, sometimes when we're thinking about things, we think that having the facts is the most important. It's not. You know, righteous, righteousness is a position. You know, when you're in Christ, you are covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so the order and the correctness of your life is determined by the character of Jesus Christ. And so when you're in a position where you're in right standing before God, that's righteous. And God told me that I didn't need to be correct about details with my wife. He used that so powerfully. Um, right before, uh, right as we were going through this, um, this thing with, um, with our three girls, Grace, Isabel, and Gabriella, um, I, didn't, I was at the hospital and the doctors told me that they were gonna die. And um, my wife was like, she was just devastated. And I, uh, I, um, I went outside and I was in a garden and I was praying and I, I didn't know what to do and I, I said, God, um, how do I comfort Jen? My wife's name is Jennifer. I was like, how do I comfort her? I don't know what to say to her. I don't know what to do with her. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I had a vision in this garden. In this garden, I saw my three little girls standing next to me and they were just beautiful little girls and their curly blonde hair and they were just standing and they were giggling. And I saw across this field, I saw Jesus standing at the other side of the field. And he had his arms out like this. And he said, 
He said, come here. And the girls started running. They ran to Jesus and they jumped into his arms and I started playing with him. And I, I'm going to tell you, it was, I was in heaven. I, I could tell. I was, in the, I was in this amazing place, this place where nothing else mattered except being with Jesus. It didn't matter what was going on in my situation. The only thing I knew was that I was in heaven. And it didn't matter whether I was hurting. It didn't matter what was going on. What mattered was that I was in heaven and Jesus was there and my daughters were there. And all of a sudden I heard a voice, that same voice that said, John, you're my son, I love you. He said, John, these girls are my daughters. I love you. I want you to go and love them as long as you have them and give them back to me. And all of a sudden it's amazing because I knew what to do. I had the answer. I just knew that I needed to be obedient because God has always been faithful to me. He's always taking care of me. There's never been a lack. So I went up and I told Jen what I just experienced and she was like sobbing hysterically because of the grief that she was going through. And I, I put my arms around her and I said, Jen, I just had this experience and I just saw Jesus and God told me that we were going to give our daughters to him and that everything was going to be okay. And so we laid with them and they died in our arms. I mean, it was the most beautiful, holy, amazing experience to have these three beautiful little girls and to give them back to God. And uh, it was really interesting because our whole family, like everybody was so invested in this um, pregnancy and these three little girls, my, my in-laws, everybody was so excited about these beautiful little granddaughters and nieces and everything. And, uh, and when they started to hear about what was happening, they were just distraught. But it was so amazing because God, because we heard God speak to us, we weren't devastated. I mean, we, we grieved and we went through this process and we had a funeral and, um, and, and it was in this big cathedral because my wife's family is all Catholic and because they were born and they had gotten, somebody had come and baptized them, they, they, they were able to go and go through this, go through a funeral there. And, uh, and when we went to the, to the memorial garden, my wife heard God tell her, that she was going to have twins. And she came up to me and she said, John, God told me that I'm going to have this right in the, right in the, right in the, uh, right in the graveyard, right in the memorial garden. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I heard her say it and I was like, okay. I mean, I didn't, really, I didn't really have a context for what she heard God say to her. Three months later, she got pregnant. And uh, a month after that, she went and she had an ultrasound. And I couldn't go with her to the ultrasound. And she called me up and she said, I knew it. I knew it. God told me that I was going to have twins. And we have two, we have two, we have two babies in, uh, inside me. So, you know, as, as a, I'm going to tell you, to be a husband and to go through two pregnancies with multiples, it's one of the most complex things you know, that you can ever go through because uh, it's complicated. It was complicated for my wife. And during that time um, when my wife was pregnant, she was so afraid that she was going to lose the girl, our, our, our twins, a boy and a girl. And um, and and that time we were kind of asking God, where should we go to church? And uh, he actually, we were driving down the street one day and we passed this Catholic church and it said a Catholic Christian community. And God told me, I want you to go to church there. And I was like, God, I really don't want to go to church there. I really don't, I don't, I really don't, I don't really want to, I, you know, I, I appreciated uh, uh, the way that, that, that God moves in situations, but I really didn't feel like I really wanted to go to a church like this. And God told me, no, I want you to go there. And so we went. And for the first four weeks, it was I, I, people weren't even nice. I'd go, we'd go into mass. People weren't nice to us. They didn't, they didn't, they weren't loving. You know, they, they would, we'd sit in the back and we didn't feel very welcome. And uh, every week I was like, I'm not going to go back next week. And uh, God told me again, and, my, and at that time my wife was going through this, this process where she was really very emotional about this whole thing with the pregnancy with the twins. She was afraid she was going to lose them. And the fourth week I went and, this, um, and uh, this deacon came in and this deacon was a spirit-filled uh, deacon. And he said, after the mass, we're gonna have a time of uh, healing prayer. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, I, and I told my wife, you know, I'm gonna go to that. And she's like, I'm not gonna go. <laughs> so I went and I walked up to the altar 
And this um, deacon came and he laid hands on me and the priest came down and he spoke this blessing over me. And as soon as he prayed over me, the Holy Spirit hit me and I had this dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you this because since that time, like I, you know, I, I don't feel that God's called me to worship in a Catholic church. But I've been a part now for the past six years where I've seen hundreds. God's opened these doors with the Catholic Church. And by the way, I have a beautiful son and a daughter. that are twins that are 14 years old. They were actually here. One of them was here with me in Belfast in June, and, uh, and Amy knows them. But um, in the past five years, I've prayed probably for five or 600 young adults at the University of St. Thomas in the seminary. And I've watched so many of them get filled with the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, as I was praying about what God is doing with us, you know, uh, in, in John, actually in Matthew 22, 36, you know, God Town's logo is, logo is love God and love people. It's Jesus says that the Pharisees, the religious leaders came up to him and said, what is the most important commandment? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And he said, the second is like it. It said, love your neighbor as yourself. And you know, I am a, God has allowed us as a community, we're a whole community that are evangelists. Like we move, we, we get to go out on the street every day and pray for people. In fact, just the other day, there was, a, um, there was a murder a couple blocks away from our house. And so our team decided that they were going to go over there and pray. I wasn't even there. My wife led it. They went over to where this murder happened. There was police tape. They prayed over the ground where the murder had happened. And before they knew it, some guy came out and asked them what they were doing. And he said, well, you should go over to that house. That's the family that was connected to this killing. So they went over to the house. They ended up praying in the house. And before they knew it, they had brought five people back to our community center and led one, one woman got healed of MS during that whole time. The thing that God has really put on my heart is that, you know, as Christians, the Bible says that people are going to know that you're Christians how. It says it in, in, in I think it's in John, it's at First John. It says they're, they're going to know that you're Christians by the way that you love each other. And the, here's the thing I just have to say, you know, you, this, the reason that our team is here, God brought us here, we're going to be praying up and down the Schenkel Road, and we're going to be praying up and down the Falls Road. Because I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit is pouring out in this generation. And in this city of Belfast, there is a, there is, a, there is, it's almost like there's a stain on the identity of God because there is a lie that I heard all the way over in America for a long time that Christians are fighting against each other. And it's a lie from hell. Christians are not fighting against each other. There's powers and principalities and rulers of darkness in heavenly places that think that they can raise their voice up and they can slander the people of God and slander the name of God. And you know who gets to stand against that? It's us. We get to stand up and we get to say that I believe in Jesus Christ and my commandment is to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, and the second is to love my neighbor as myself. And what happens is the Holy Spirit pours out. That is the way that the Holy Spirit moves in revival. And the core of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is when we stand together. You know, you know if, you're, if, you're in a, if you're a soldier in the battle and you're divided, from the other people that you're supposed to be fighting with, you know what the enemy does to you? He kills you and he takes you out. Sniper will come and he'll shoot you out because you're not standing with the other people that God's called you to be. And, and you know, the, and when, John, when Jesus, in John chapter 17, so Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and he is, what's he doing? He's sweating blood. He's, he's weeping blood and he's about to go to the cross. And what is his prayer? His prayer is for us. It says, he says, you gave me these ones, the 12. These, you gave me these ones. And he says, I'm about to give them back to you and the world is going to hate them. And, the, and there is a devil that's going to come and he's going to try to separate them. And he says, Father, would you make them one just as we are one? And you know, pray the Lord's Prayer at the beginning because 
I believe that, you know, I, I have had the opportunity to minister to Hindus and to uh, shamans and to Muslims and to atheists and to unchurched people. And, you know, they don't know who Jesus is. But when you declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, that means that you are identifying yourself that Jesus is your Lord and you're a follower of Jesus. And so I don't care. I mean, I, to me, I do not want to compromise on truth. I do not want to compromise on doctrine. I don't want to compromise on anything. But the one thing that I know is that when I love my brother or I love my sister, the whole world knows that I'm following Jesus and they can see it. When I'm walking down the street with these three, you know, God bless me to have three beautiful lasses that I get to do ministry with. But when I have, you know, we were here in, in June, we had 25, and they were red and yellow, black and white. And when we were walking down the Shankill Road or when we were walking down in the Titanic District, people wanted to hang out with us. Do you know why? Because we were loving each other and we were having fun. And when you're in the kingdom of God and you're moving in what God has, you can come, you know, people think I'm happy all the time. I'm full of joy all the time. I have not, you know, since I had an encounter where God came and totally transformed my life, I don't have bad days. I haven't had a bad, I can't even think of the last bad day I had. And I don't even want to. I love being in the presence of the most high God. And I can tell when I make a decision to not identify with who he is, or what he's doing, when I don't accurately discern the body of Christ, you know what happens when we don't accurately discern the body of Christ? We ended up being separated and we get sick. And I really feel like there is a lot of oppression that is, and it's not over this church, but in this community, there's a religious oppression there's a heavy, heavy weight that's too heavy to carry. And I feel like God is saying that he wants to release you and set you free from that. I believe that there's a healing, like a lot of the afflictions that we deal with, infirmities, stress, trauma, all these things. When we have unforgiveness or when we have, uh, when we have suspicion or when we have anxiety about other people, when we, when we you know, I, I work in a, uh, right in an area that has lots of Muslims, and I didn't really know a lot about Muslims when God told me to go out and start prayer walking. And I remember walking down the street and seeing a little tiny woman with a burqa on and feeling like she was Dracula, and I was like, <laughs> and I realized that was me. It was not her. It was not her problem, it was my problem because I couldn't even feel free to worship God because I had this, uh, this oppressive feeling about who she was. It wasn't, I was not discerning a spirit. I, actually, I was a discerning a spirit, it was my spirit. And my spirit was in disorder. And I asked God, I was like, God, what do you, how do you feel about this? And at that time, the Muslim community where we were, there were people that were coming and trying to recruit them out to blow themselves up in Somalia. And I was praying and I was following this woman and I heard this, this thing and I was like, God, how do you feel about this? What is going on? And all of a sudden in my spirit, I heard a mother crying out for her sons that were being taken away by a demonic force to blow themselves up. And I, I repented. I was like, oh, God, forgive me for my judgment. My judgment keeps me from being able to go out and minister to this person that you sent to my community so that they could experience love, God, just like I love God. And so I want to encourage you. I, I think I'm going to close, but I want to invite you. If you feel, you know, I really feel like there is value in getting on your knees. And I feel like there's value and laying down burdens. I know that the, the, the times in my life where I've had big deliverance or I've had big anxiety, I've just gone and laid on my face on the altar and in worship and God has totally delivered me and set me free and healed me. You know, I can jump. I was crippled for almost 20 years. And it was through a time where God had a guy come and pray for my heart that, um, that my, my hips got healed and I can walk, and I don't have pain, I don't play basketball, but I can walk, and I feel good. So I wanna take a little bit of time, and it, we're, ju we're just gonna pray. I'm gonna actually, Bethany, why don't you sing, and, uh, and Pastor Johnny, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, but, um, I, and we'll pray for people, but if you have something that you feel is holding you from being free to love your neighbor as yourself, we're just gonna turn it over and ask God to move in it, so.
Father, we just thank you for your word. Father, I just thank you for the brothers and sisters and the children. Lord, I thank you that you, your word is that like a prophet like Elijah is going to come and he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And if it doesn't happen, that you'd strike the land with a curse. And I thank you that you've given me children, Lord God. And in this community, Lord God, there's fathers and there's mothers here and there's children. There's young men and young women who are desperate to have that love and that care, and they're missing those things in their own families, Lord God. We ask, Lord God, that you rise up men that have a heart like you do, Father, that love their neighbors, Lord God, that love the children around them, Lord God. Lord, we just ask for mothers, Lord God, that are bold and courageous, Lord God, that would love children that are not even their own children, Lord God. Lord, we ask that you'd come and bring healing, Lord God, Lord, I just thank you for delivering me, Lord God. And I just ask that you'd bring a mission and a vision for what you're doing in this season for us to walk in revival that you have for us. That you'd revive us, Lord God, that we wouldn't be disconnected members of the body, that we would have your blood, Jesus, flowing through us, that we'd have your spirit and your presence flowing through us as we're connected and as we're one healthy body of Christ. And I just thank you, Lord God. I thank you for the people of the Falls Road, and I thank you for the people of the Shankill Road, Lord God. I thank you for the people of Ireland, Lord God. I thank you for the people that you cared so much, Lord God. You you this passion that you sent St. Patrick to come and to, to bless this land, Lord God. Thank you for what you're doing in this place, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's almost tangible, the presence of the Holy Spirit here. God wants to move in each one of our lives. We have to be open for God to move. And when we're open and let God move in us, then we can move in our communities. We can make the difference within our families but we have to let God move let's just stand together as a family as a church
And as we're standing in the Lord's presence, let's just say to him, reaffirm to him if you need to, that Lord, I am here. I want to be used by you. I want to make a difference within my family, within my community. Father, help me love my fellow man. Help me see my neighbors through your eyes. Father, this morning we stand in your presence, Lord. And we know, Lord, that in our lives we fall far short, Lord, of where we should be, Lord. But, Lord, we come to you again, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you move in our lives, Lord, so that people will see you through us and come to a personal relationship with you. Father, pray for each member represented here, each home that's represented. I pray, Lord, that you will move in lives, in homes, in communities for your glory. In your name we ask. Amen.